Today, we're going to be speaking with Jean Guerrero, who's author of Hate Monger, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump and the White Nationalist Agenda. Uh, great to have you on, Jean. Great to be here. So first, just to start with, before we get into really the substance, if people don't know who Stephen Miller is, uh, if they pay attention to the things Trump says, a, a lot of those come from the mind of Stephen Miller and sometimes from the pen of Stephen Miller. But who, who is this guy? How did he get involved with Donald Trump? Exactly. You know, Stephen Miller is not only one of Trump's top speechwriters, he is also the immigration policy architect. So he's a senior policy advisor for Trump with a major focus on the immigration issue. But you see him shaping his rhetoric on on pretty much everything. And he is a Jewish American uh, who comes from Santa Monica, California. And he got involved with the Trump campaign after working with Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions and, and various other people in Congress for a little while um, and, and really becoming interested in, you know, a person who who he felt was was not politically correct and who gave voice to a lot of the feelings that he'd had ever since he was a teenager. You know, Stephen Miller, from the time that he, he was a teenager in Santa Monica, he would go around his 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 very diverse high school telling his Mexican classmates to go back to their countries, telling them to speak English. Uh, he broke up with a, a Mexican friend telling him he couldn't be friends with someone with a Latino heritage. Um, so he, he was he was from a very young age expressing these kinds of beliefs. When, and when he heard Trump talking about Mexicans as rapists and criminals, he got very excited and started to contribute free labor to his campaign in the form of talking points, in the form of immigration policies, and eventually got hired. What how does someone like Stephen Miller end up given where he was born and given? I mean, you know, as, as a Jewish Latino American myself, I can say that you, you're Jews in the United States, a very reliably left wing group, 75, 80, even 85 percent support of Democratic presidents in the past. Uh, I don't I'm involved in all sorts of national Jewish groups. I've never met anyone who would even consider working for someone like Jeff Sessions, who even if for Jewish Republicans would be almost too far to really get involved in. How does a California guy like this end up with these beliefs? Well, David, it, I, I really see it as a case study in radicalization. Um, you know, when he was a teenager, he was going through a very hard time. His family had lost a lot of money related to their real estate company. They had to move from a very affluent part of Santa Monica uh, to a slightly less affluent and more diverse part. Stephen Miller ends up having to go to a, a public high school instead of a, a mostly white private high school. And, you know, during this time period, he meets this man named David Horowitz, who is a former Marxist turned right wing radical who was writing things at the time about how the only real racism is racism against white men, that racism against black and brown people is a figment of your imagination, that everything that we hold dear in society in, as Americans is a result of white men, things like justice, equality, uh, freedom, that these are all thanks to, to white men. And so these are ideas that he introduced Stephen Miller to. He ends up becoming like a father figure to Stephen Miller and teaching him the weapons of the civil rights movement as a person who came from the left in order to attack the civil rights movement. So he taught Stephen Miller how to invert and deflect the language of the left, uh, casting white men as victims of discrimination based on their skin color, casting people of color as the real racists or the real oppressors. Um, and this is language that Stephen Miller used throughout his career. David Horowitz got him his first jobs in, in Congress, um, you know, first with Tea Party Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, and then with John Shadag of Arizona, and finally with uh, Jeff Sessions of Alabama. Um, but, he, but he introduced him to these really white supremacist ideas and how to launder them through the language of heritage and the language of national security and the language of economics in order to make these ideas palatable to the mainstream, which is what Stephen Miller has been doing in the speeches of Donald Trump um, over the course of his, his time working for him. This question might apply more generally than just to Stephen Miller, but there's this incredible irony of someone who is part of a group that was not considered white by the white European oppressors for so long, right? Jews were, were the whole much anti Semitic discrimination is based on the idea that Jews are not white. Jumping in full bore to 
repeat the talking points that were essentially used against Jews that that and that's really probably a broader phenomena that we see among some on the right. Exactly. You know, he takes ideas directly from white nationalist and white supremacist literature. This has been documented, you know, emails I've reviewed of his strategy papers that he's worked on. Um, and these are groups that not only vilify and, and promote violence against people of color, but th they feel the same way ab about the Jewish people. And it's a, it's a real conflict that exists inside of Stephen Miller. Most of his family ha is appalled at what he's been doing in the White House as far as the rhetoric and the policies, which largely target um, immigrants who are fleeing persecution and, and violence in their home countries. You know, Stephen Miller's grandmother on his mother's side, Ruth, she spent her retirement um, compiling the family history so that Stephen Miller and her other grandchildren would never forget the value of people who come to this country in, in nothing but the clothes on their back and, and speaking no English, which is how Stephen Miller's great grandparents came here from Eastern Europe, fleeing a persecution, fleeing nationalist agitators um, in Eastern Europe. And, and she also recorded for him the lessons of, of, you know, the dangers of demonization. And these are lessons that, that met most people in the Jewish community, you know, value and, and understand how important they are. But they're lessons that Stephen Miller from the time that he, he was young has been not only ignoring, but, but directly attacking. And it's worth noting that his mentor, David Horowitz, is also, you know, a, a Jewish man. And, and he, you know, he, he's he he sort of his entryway into white nationalist uh, ideologies, which which he would you know he he constantly says he's not a white nationalist, he's not a racist. But if you look at his his writings, they're very much um, it, echoing these white nationalist talking points. Um, but he but anyway, he 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 starts out with this very anti-Palestine, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim mentality, um, and eventually you know Stephen Miller broadens that out to include um, all all immigrants. But this is why you saw one of the first actions that he took in the White House was the Muslim ban. Um, and, and then eventually, you know, the, the systematic separation of, of migrant children from their parents and the systematic dismantling of the asylum system at the U.S.-Mexico border uh, and, and the destruction of the refugee admissions system as it exists in the United States. Most of these policies ha have impacted people seeking legal pathways into this country because they are desperate, because, you know, they're facing death threats at home. This is not about c criminals and cartels crossing the border, sneaking across the border illegally. Um, Stephen Miller's policies disproportionately impact families who are trying to do things the legal way. And yeah, this is, this because is, uh, he derived this is not MS-13, as Donald Trump often likes to talk about at rallies. Well, and that's something that Stephen Miller inserts into Trump's speeches. He knows that MS-13 is, is like this, you know, thing, the symbol that he can use to rally people around policies that harm families overall. Um, but but yeah, I mean, the reason that these policies work this way is because he's pulling them directly from think tanks created by a man named John Tanton, a eugenicist who believed in population control for non-white people, uh, a white supremacist who believed in the genetic superiority of whites. And these think tanks like the Federation for American Immigration Reform you know, they, 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 they seem innocuous, they have very banal sounding intellectual names, but they exist to, to weed, to, to find ways to dismantle uh, legal pathways into this country for people from Latin America and Africa. So to zoom out a little bit, uh, very often when the topic of, of the Trump administration and Trump's uh, rhetoric and white nationalism comes up, you will hear these sort of reflexive defenses about uh, Trump's son in law is Jewish and his uh, you know daughter converted, his grandkids are Jewish and that type of thing. When I interviewed white nationalist Rich Richard Spencer years ago during the Trump administration, he said that he doesn't expect Trump to actually come out and say things exactly the way he says them, but that he sees Trump as sort of like the closest thing to his ideology. Although more recently, Spencer himself has said they're kind of done with Trump and OK, fine, we, we can move past that. But my, my question more broadly is, what are the ways in which Donald Trump's language, maybe even unknown to Trump because it's being inserted by Miller, it doesn't matter. What are the ways in which Trump has sort of signaled to these groups that at least to some degree he's their guy? 
Well, to start with a more recent example, I mean, Trump, for his real strategy, has been really working to conflate anti-racist protesters and Black Lives Matter protesters with, quote, agitators and anarchists and mobs who want to destroy this country. That language of agitators and anarchists referring to anti-racist protesters comes directly from a book called The Camp of the Saints, uh, which Stephen Miller promoted through Breitbart in 2015, and which is about the destruction of the white world by brown people described as monsters and beasts and teeming ants toiling for the white man's comfort. Um, and that this book explicitly endorses hatred and violence against people of color as a survival mechanism. So it promotes the conspiracy theory of white genocide that has motivated so many acts of white supremacist terrorism, including the El Paso massacre that we saw last August, where 23 people were killed by a man who thought he was saving the United States from a, quote, Hispanic invasion. Um, and so, 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 so his language is, is really dog whistling. If you can even call it, I don't even think it's even necessarily dog whistling. I think it's directly echoing the white genocide theory. Are there other examples in terms of Trump specific lines? I mean, early there was, you know, looking at the origins of America first and it sounds relatively benign. And, uh, you know, how could something just so 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 uh, uh, simple uh, have the, the this horrible origin, uh, so so to speak? Are there other examples you think are the relevant ones to think about? Yes. Yeah, so, so what a very common recruiting tactic in white supremacist circles is to use uh, to highlight, um, you know, examples of alleged crimes committed by people of color. And this is something that Trump has been doing from the very earliest stages of the campaign. And, and he started out with this sort of more instinctual, emotional racism, saying that Mexicans were were criminals and rapists. But when Stephen Miller joined, he he started to really use very graphic gory descriptions of alleged migrant crimes that really works to incite white fear and white hatred. <clears throat> An example being, you know, referring to migrants slashing people with machetes or, or crushing a woman's eye sockets with a hammer, um, you know, butchering little girls, <clears throat> language that is extremely violent and is and is meant to to provoke, you know, real sense of fear. That is something that comes from Stephen Miller. Also, the use of false migrant crime statistics saying that, you know, thousands of Americans have been murdered by by Ill quote illegal immigrants. This is this is false. You know, immigrants, whether they come to this country legally or illegally, are actually less likely to commit crimes than uh, citizens. But it's, but Trump constantly uses false statistics about immigrants, and this is Stephen Miller pulling from the white supremacist recruiting tactics that he's familiar. Uh, websites like American Renaissance, uh, which he has been um, you know inspired by for for several years, and which uses this tactic of highlighting migrant crimes and, and pumping out mis false and misleading uh, crime, statistics, crime statistics about migrants as well as black people. Uh, the book is fascinating. It's called Hate Monger, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump and the White Nationalist Agenda. We've been speaking with the book's author, Jean Guerrero. Uh, so great to talk to you. And I really appreciate your time. And, and the, the, the book is excellent. Thank you so much, David.